In the last section of this course, we go over various commands that might become useful at some point that uh, didn't fit anywhere else. The du command, du is for disk usage, will show you how much space various directories and files occupy on your hard drive. As you might recall, the ls-l command will show you the file size in bytes, but it will not show you the size of all the files in a directory, and that's what the du command is for. DU has a couple options that you very commonly see. The minus H option will make the file sizes human readable. What that means is that instead of a long number of bytes, you get something like 5G if it's 5 gigabytes. The minus S option will show you the total, or in other words, the sum of everything else in the list. And the minus C option will show you individual files. You can simply summarize these options into one. The order doesn't matter. This is equivalent to specifying these three options separately. In this directory, which is the same example directory that I've used throughout the course, I can use du-sch on everything, and it will simply print the file sizes on everything and a summary. The counterpart to the du command is the df command, that will show you how much of your disk is still free. The history command will show you previous commands that you typed. You might remember that you can scroll through previous commands that you typed with the up arrow and down arrow keys. If you type the history command, it will simply print you the whole list. If I go through backwards now, it will go up the list. The way the bash console stores your history is it creates a file in your home directory that's called .bash underscore history. You can, same way as typing that command, you can simply open this one with a text editor. It's completely equivalent. One trick that's very useful, if you type a command but you don't remember what exact options you used, you can go through the history and you can pipe that into grep. That's something we've already seen. The pipe symbol will take the output command from history, put it into grab, and with grab you can then specify a search string. You can specify links, what's called symbolic links in Linux, with the ln command. Links work kind of similar to desktop links in Windows. These links are called soft links or symbolic links. They are different from hard links. I won't go into hard links. They do basically similar things, but they work a little differently. If you want to specify a link, you use ln-s for soft link. Whatever other options you may need, the target file or directory and what you want the link to be called. You can see where a link points to with ls-l or with the which command. In my example directory, if I type ls-l, there's a link here. This is the link, and that's where it points to. Another useful command that I want to highlight is called watch. What the watch command does is you put it in front of any other Linux command, and it will execute that Linux command at regular intervals, by default every two seconds. You can, in principle, put any command behind the watch command. That's especially useful if you want to monitor something that gets updated. A very common case that's especially useful to HPC users. You might have a program that constantly updates a log file. For example, maybe it iterates through time steps and it writes every new time step to that log file. If you want to keep monitoring that log file, instead of reloading it and reloading it over and over, you can simply use tail to print out the last couple lines and then put a watch command in front of that and you will have a constantly updating display of the last couple lines. The watch command will lock you into a different screen. You can leave that with control C like you used to. For example, if I say watch date, it will keep printing the date. You can see at the top what interval is being used. 
then you can see the date at which the command was executed. And below that, you can see the output from the command, which in this case, because it's the date command, it's just the date and time again. Leave the screen with control C. And that's the watch command. If you're ever in a shell script need to do some basic math with integer numbers, there's a very simple way for you to do that. You simply use two pairs of round brackets. You already know that syntax dollar sign and brackets will execute the command that's in the brackets. If you use dollar signs with two brackets, it will interpret whatever is in here as math. In this case, it's a simple addition. It cannot do much. It can do basic math operations, plus, minus, and so on. It cannot do floating point operations. So it's limited to integer. What you can do, however, is use variables in that. For example, if you used a variable in here that you simply recall with dollar sign and the variable name, like we saw earlier, then the double brackets will simply resolve that variable name and it will print the output from the command. In the case of echo, of course, it will simply print the result of the screen. You can, of course, now also have another variable name equals sign and then the output. So you can assign the output to a different variable. Another tool that you commonly see is called the stream editor, set for short. And what set does is it's intended for very simple text operations. The most common example you see is if you have a short text string and you want to replace that with something new. This example does exactly that. It takes the text old and replaces it with new. The basic syntax is set, then the options that you might want to use, what you want set to do, and the files that you want set to work with. There's a similar tool that you commonly see. It's called org. It does kind of the similar thing. It's more powerful. It can do more complex things. I'm mentioning these two because you often see them and they're commonly used. I do not necessarily recommend for you to use them because the syntax for those two is a bit tricky to learn and not very obvious for newbies. Finally, one more thing that I want to at least mention. It doesn't usually concern you as a normal user, but I want you to at least understand the basic principle behind it. In Linux, software is often installed in the form of packages. Very often, whoever makes that particular Linux distribution also maintains a central repository for software. The advantage is that a software that's in the official repository very often will have been tested to be compatible with that particular Linux distribution. You almost always need root to install software packages. There are some exceptions to that. For example, various programming languages come with their own package manager that's only specific to that language. If you use Python, you might have used pip before. That's the package manager for Python. And pip, for example, has an option to install the Python package in your own user directory. So you will not need root and it will not be available to any other users. The programming language R has a similar feature and uh, various other applications and programming languages have it nowadays. The software that you actually use to install Linux packages depends on the distribution. There are three major programs for this. The Debian family, which includes Ubuntu, uses something called apt-get or apt and uses a package format that ends in .deb. The yum package manager is more common in the Red Hat family of Linux distributions and uses RPM files. And if you ever use SUSE Linux, it comes with its own program. It's called Zipper. It also uses RPM package files. So just as an information to you, if you ever run into one of these names, you know what it is. <laughs>